Good morning. As always, let's remember that God is good. All the time. And all the time. God, God is, is good. good. Today's scripture comes from the uh, New Testament book of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. I'm sure you remember this story. Listen as I read. Stand as you are able. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who was born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him, and calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was, was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophets. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Good leaders are hard to find, whereas bad leaders are readily available. Here are three comments about bad leaders given by those under their leadership. Our leader should go far, and the sooner he goes, the better. My leader is depriving a village somewhere of its idiot. And my last report concerning our illustrious leader, I said he had reached rock bottom, and then he began to dig. One of the most important things to have in today's world is leadership. Every business, large or small, yearns for, perhaps even prays for, a strong, effective leader. When the Chrysler Corporation was on the verge of bankruptcy, the Iacocca was hired to save this troubled country. Within five years, Chrysler experienced a profit of more than $925 million. It's leadership that can make or break a business. Yes, leadership is important in business, but it's also important in politics and in religion as well. What type of leader, more specifically, what type of leadership style is best for today's ever-changing world? Let's take a look at two distinctly different leadership styles. King Herod, whom I just read about, gives us one style of leadership, that being leadership through force. Herod the Great, Herod the Great he was called, but don't let that title mislead you. Herod was the king of a rather small area. Included in there were Judea, Samaria, and Galilee. Herod wasn't given the responsibility of that leadership because he had any specific qualifications. Oh no, he inherited this throne from his father, who had been appointed by the Romans to keep a tight rein on the Jews. They thought those people were a bit contentious. Herod was a petty tyrant, and even more than that, he was a petty man. And when I say petty, I mean of little importance. He was in his 70s when the news came to him of the impending birth of the king of the Jews. Three astrologers from the east came to his court to see what they might learn about a mysterious star they had been following. As they questioned him, questioned him, Herod flew into a rage. A rage. This rage resulted in the slaughter, and I repeat that, the slaughter of all the boys in Bethlehem and the vicinity who were two years of age and younger. Herod was an intolerant man, a bully, a dictator, and he ruled with nothing but force. There have been leaders like Herod throughout history, and sadly to say, there are leaders like Herod in this world today. Some of them lead nations, some of them lead businesses, and some of them lead families. They do so perhaps because that's the only way they know how to lead. Leading by force is one leadership style. Allow me to share an alternative style, that being leadership through service. Florence Nightingale, I'm sure you know that name. She was a servant. She was born into a wealthy, well-connected family in Florence, Italy, hence her name. And she was born in 1820. Because of her family's prestigious standing, Florence could have lived a pampered life her entire, her entire lifetime. Her mother was a socialite who delighted in hosting extravagant parties and savored lavish possessions. She was very materialistic. 
Her father was a successful banker, but he took a very serious interest in Florence's education and in her moral development. At the age of 21, her family moved from Italy to England. In the 1840s, England was a, a miserable place for most people to live. Poverty plagued this island country. At the age of 30, Florence traveled. She went to Egypt, she went to Greece, where she spent some time at the Institute of Protestant Deaconesses. This institute was comprised of a group of humble women who devoted their time to charitable works, service works, if you will. This provided a very stark contrast to Florence in her growing up years because her rich friends were nothing like that. She returned to England and obtained employment as a nurse in a hospital for poor women. When the hospital tried to restrict care to only members of the Church of England women, Florence fought, fought to allow all women, regardless of what their religion was, to receive care in that hospital, and she won. She is best known for her work in the Crimean War, where she organized and trained hundreds of volunteer nurses. For your information, Crimea is now a part of Russia. Florence and her nurse, nurses endured horrendous conditions and dangers throughout this war. So they cared for thousands and thousands of wounded soldiers. While there, she was stricken with something called hospital fever, but she continued to work even through this illness. After the, after the war, she worked as an educator and wrote a definitive nursing guide and opened her home for nurses. Florence Nightingale died at the age of 90 after devoting her life to the service of hundreds and hundreds of people. She single-handedly transformed the face of nursing, making it a very well-regulated and very well-respected profession. Florence didn't establish this servant leadership style. Oh, no. She merely followed the servanthood example set forth by someone who came before her. And I think you know where I'm going with this. This service leader was, of course, Jesus Christ. Jesus was, without a doubt, a strong leader, so strong that the organization he founded is still prospering 2,000 years after his death. I'm going to ask you three questions. Question number one, how did Jesus do this? Question number two, how was he so successful in what he did? And question number three, what can we learn from the way Jesus led his organization that might be applied in today's world? Well, the answer to all three of these questions lies in his leadership principles. And of course, there are three of those. Principle number one, Jesus painted a vision. No business, no institution succeeds today if its leader doesn't have a clear vision of what he or she wants for their organization. Jesus painted a vision for his disciples, and that vision was this, the kingdom of God. The disciples had a difficult time grasping this division, this vision initially. In fact, I don't know that they truly appreciated that, that vision until after Jesus had died. But the fact that we have a church right here, and I'm standing in it, we have a church right here some 2,000 years after his death, is evidence that the disciples finally got it, and what about what they were told to do, and that we get it today. The vision that Jesus painted of the kingdom was that of the kingdom of service. Jesus said in Mark 10, verses 43 through 45, whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave to all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This was Jesus' vision. There was a Broadway production a few years ago titled 1776. This play centered around one main character, John Adams, as he attempted to get the Second Continental Congress to declare independence from England. The times called for a change, but some of the members of the Congress were slow to move. Adams, seeing the issues very clearly, struggled to gather support for what he believed in so strongly. Even though no colleagues had ever broken away from a mother country, these men needed to vote for independence. Unfortunately, John Dickinson from Pennsylvania got
got a motion passed that in order to approve this declaration written by Thomas Jefferson, and I think you know what declaration I'm talking about, the vote had to be unanimous. Dickinson did so because he felt not all 13 colonies would vote yes. Emergency dispatches were sent from George Washington, General George Washington, Chief of the Continental Forces, writing that action be taken now. Well, on the night of July 3rd, 1776, Congress Hall was empty, except for John Adams. South Carolina and Pennsylvania were on the fence. They were unsure. Del Delaware was leaning towards voting yes, but was yet undecided. Wrestling with the vision shared by only 10 of the 13 colonies, Adams paced back and forth that night. Suddenly he stopped and he looked to heavens and he said, is anybody there? Does anybody care? Does anybody see what I see? Jesus could see what the disciples didn't see. He saw the kingdom of God, the kingdom of service. He painted a picture for them. That's the first step for any leadership. Have a vision and share that vision. Principle number two, Jesus led with love and not fear. Jesus was a master motivator, absolutely no doubt about that. He understood that you could accomplish more with love than you could with fear. Maybe it's because of my impatience, but I find it extraordinary how patient Jesus was with his 12 disciples. They were ordinary men. Sometimes they were quarrelsome. Sometimes they lacked courage. Other times they were very infantile. In Mark 10, James and John looked at Jesus and asked this, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. These disciples sounded to me like first graders, hoping to get a favor from their teacher. Jesus looked at him and asked this question, What do you want me to do for you? Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus shook his head, saying, You don't know what you're asking. I wonder if any other leader would have handled those disciples that gently. Their question showed that they had no understanding of what this kingdom was all about. They viewed the kingdom as one of power rather than one of service. But Jesus kept his cool. He led through love and not fear. Jesus had no interest in intimidating his disciples. He dealt with them patiently and with concern, and I might say with compassion. Jesus first painted a vision, then he led. He led with love. But there's a third thing to note about Jesus' leadership style, and perhaps it's the most important. Jesus led through example. In Matthew 20, 20, Jesus asked James and John this question. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? We are able, they both replied, together. But they had no idea what Jesus was asking of them. The writer of Hebrews knew what Jesus was talking about. He called Jesus our great high priest. Hebrews 5, 7 tells us, listen as I read. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his godly fear. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Jesus didn't just talk about laying down one's life for others. Jesus laid down his life for all. Jesus didn't just talk about the high cost of love. Jesus showed his love always. Jesus didn't just talk about victory over death. He showed us what that is, victory over death. Jesus led by example. This is the type of leadership who can move people to higher ground, a leader who walks the talk, a leader who spends his or her time serving rather than being served. Jesus painted a vision, a vision of kingdom of love and service. He showed us what the kingdom was like through both his patient love and his willingness to lay down his life on our behalf. Servant leadership is the very opposite of Herod's approach. Servant leaders identify with the people whom they lead. 
Servant leaders are willing to get their hands dirty, working alongside their people. But beyond this, Jesus' leadership tells us something about the nature of God. God is not a God of whom we need to be afraid. God is not a dictator. We can approach God just like a loving, patient parent, with confidence and with joy, with the assurance that he will never turn away from us. Some years ago, Life magazine set out to record what young children thought about God. They handed out cameras to 56 children between the ages of 8 and 13. On the roll were 12 pictures. They asked them to take pictures that would reflect what God meant to them. Anything that made them think of God was game for a photograph. Well, most of the children returned with 12 pictures of people that they knew and people that they loved or things that they knew and played with and loved. But some children's pictures were a little bit different. One nine-year-old boy took one picture of his social worker's office door. When asked why he took that picture, he said, because inside that door is a lady who is very nice to me, and she reminds me of God. An eight-year-old boy named Chris used up all of his film taking 12 pictures of the sky. When asked why he only took pictures of the sky, he said, because that is where heaven is, and that's where my little sister Tina is. You see, there was a fire in our house. Mommy and I got out, but Tina didn't. Tina died in that house. The interviewer then asked him a question. Well, if, if you think God is powerful, how could he let that happen to your little sister? The little boy said, well, God was probably working that day. The interviewer said, maybe God didn't know that there was a fire. And the little boy said, oh, yes, God knew there was a fire. God knows everything. He knew, but he was just busy helping somebody else that day, I think. To tell you the truth, I don't know how to answer the interviewer's question any more than I would be able to answer the parents of those infants slain during the time of Herod. All I know is that if it's not God's will that any child should ever die, there is much I don't understand, but God is the God who revealed himself in a manger in Bethlehem. God is a God of love, God of mercy, God of hope, and a God of peace. God doesn't coerce by force people, but leads by love, the love shown to us through his son Jesus Christ during his life and his death. If you're looking for a leader to guide you through this life of yours, I can recommend no other leader, no other leader than our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.